have had pain and or fatigue as part of your thyroid story or continue to, a bit like I do, then you're going to want to stick around for the rest of this episode. It's episode 104 of the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. I'm talking with Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum all about pain. He is actually a chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia uh, expert uh, from America. He is a certified internist. He's known nationally, you know, for that specialty in chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, ME, connects in with thyroid health. He's written lots of books. I don't know, about 10, I think. Uh, I have read the, his very popular book called From Fatigued to Fantastic. And we talk about that in this interview along with his Shine Protocol. So stick around to have a listen. Don't forget at the end, I will do um, pose a couple of questions, some Kiss Thyroid coaching questions. So just to help you to sit back and rela- uh, not relax, <laughs> to reflect on what you just about well, what you're just about to listen to and what you will have heard at the end of the episode. So, all right. Well, welcome, Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast all the way from Hawaii. You're my first Hawaiian guest on the show. So that's pretty exciting. Welcome. <laughs> Aloha and welcome, everybody. Um, and, you know, for those of you who continue to have fatigue, continue to have pain, um, what we're going to do today is teach you why and how to make it go away. Your doctor is likely a very nice, caring person. But if they've been trained as most physicians have been, they have no clue what they're doing when treating thyroid, fatigue, or pain. So we're going to help you become your, your own experts so you can feel great. Yeah, excellent. I'm, I'm looking forward to this because, yeah, I'm one of those people that does get pain from, you know, I, I would say there's always some part of my body that's hurting. So I, uh, I, you know, I think I said in my notes to you, I have a vested interest in this podcast episode too. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I have had a, uh, well, I wouldn't say a, a, a solid, solid read, but I've had a good read of your book that I can see behind you from fatigue to fantastic that will dive, you know, into some of that, I'm sure. And so for those that, are listening and if you're dealing with fatigue or pain which is probably a lot of us most of us that are listening to this podcast the the book is very very specific it's what I've really liked about what I've read of it is it's you provide so much so much information so many protocols and you know detail of you know take this supplement at this dose and you know and so obviously you've been dealing with this for a very long period of time <laughs> well, you know, 50 50 years it's um, 50 years. Wow. When I when I first came down with the conditions myself, that was 1975. And I first started medicine in 1972. Um, right. So it's it's been a while. And I'm mm. a science geek. Uh, Annabelle, I mean, I, I, they called me the phantom in med school because two, three in the morning, I'd be in the hospital in the medical library just going through the stacks of studies and going through the journals. And I know that God and the universe loves me because the most beautiful girl in the world married me, said, I think, for science geeks. And I was like, thank <laughs> God. You know, it was um, <laughs> uh, going through the scientific literature, even in medical school, it was a shock to me to realize that what I was being taught was not what the medical literature showed. Mm. What I was being taught is what the pharmaceutical industry PR department, and they're all sweethearts. I've never met anybody in industry who's not in love, but they are selling their drugs. And um, the it just was a shock to me. And mm. then um, I came down with chronic fatigue syndrome myself, fibromyalgia, ME, uh, basically a post-viral, um, and it knocked me out of med school, left me homeless. And this is what inspired me to really look at the medical profession, where it shines, where it doesn't. There's some things mm. that's brilliant that. Um, and there's some things like treating thyroid, pain, and fatigue issues where they, not so medical word, they good and well suck. They don't know what they're doing and they don't know that they don't know what they're doing. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's a, from a patient perspective, we get so frustrated, don't you know, and I mean, I've been saying to to people because I think I've had a, even just in the last couple of years really better understanding that really the problem is that with the medical education it's not the individual doctors are really just doing what they've been trained to do which is you've got mm -hmm. you know a thyroid <laughs> function problem treat, let's just give you treat the TSH yeah we'll treat the TSH we'll give you some thyroid Period. meds off you go there's nothing more you can do 
you know, and I was told that 27 years ago, but people are still being told that today. And it, and I think, yeah, it's the training, isn't it? It's that education, as you say, the medical education. Yes. So well, thank goodness there are people like you, doctors that really kind of are keen on the science and have a vested interest because you've got your own health condition um, to have to, to manage. That seems to be the ones that yep. have to dig a and, bit deeper. Yeah, and my job is just go ahead and give you the understanding you need, not in high science. I'm very good at science. I'm also quite good at putting it into English. So what mm-hmm. we're going to do today is help you understand, number one, why are the blood tests wrong? Mm-hmm. <laughs> why are the treatments they're giving not optimal? Mm. When are other things coexisting with the low thyroid, such as you may have Hashimoto's, but then that's a common trigger for fibromyalgia or ME. And how do you tell what's going on? How do you treat the whole thing? So we're going to make you your own expert today. So you can go ahead and get your life back. That's why I'm here. Perfect. So where, well, where would you like to start then, um, Jacob? But with with that, you you start, you're the expert. Tell me, where do you want to start with that connection with the thyroid health part? And we can go from there. So number one, if you're listening and you feel fantastic and everything is great, don't waste your time. Go do something else that's fun. (laughs) <laughs> if you're having specific problems like fatigue, like brain fog, like pain, uh, or a host of other things, let's go ahead and dissect each of those and just take it in step by thing. So, Annabelle, what I'd like to do, I'm, I'm sure that the listeners, you've educated them what are the main thyroid conditions, what is Hashimoto's mm-hmm. and Graves, and what yeah, are the different yeah. things that are going on. So, you guys already yeah. know that. Um, yeah. So, let's start with number one, um, testing. Because the main test, we're taught in medical school, uh, one, most doctors wish that you would just stay home and just send the test result. We are taught so much to not trust the art of medicine, our own abilities with the art of medicine. We want something written down on a piece of paper that is either yes or no, and that we can do this and get on to the next person because we have six minutes or so per case, and then on a next. So, you know, they're well-meaning, but they're not allowed to listen to you. Mm-hmm. They won't get paid for the time. Um, so why is the testing not reliable? Several reasons. One, the machines just aren't that reliable. I remember when I first started in internal medicine, that's my specialty, um, each new patient, I would get a general chemistry and I would get a cholesterol panel back in the days when I thought cholesterol was meaningful as you know for treatment. Um, and I would get both of those. Each of those panels had a cholesterol level. And my patients were coming from all over the country, so it wasn't a single lab that had a problem. These are major labs around the country. Routinely, the cholesterol level on the two panels were 20 to 160 points apart. Hmm. And the same person, same blood draw. But because it was black and white, we thought, oh, this is must be so. Um, And for the main, there are two main national labs in the United States. I called the pathologist, I, uh, the, one of the main labs, and I said, you guys have a problem. I took the next 20 people. I said, these are not even close on the same tube of blood. They immediately, immediately solved that problem. It never happened again because whenever I ordered two panels, they deleted one of the results. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So, number one, the testing just isn't that reliable. Number two, most doctors have no clue what the normal range means. When I came out of medical school, I had the impression that the normal range on a test, what you had was a group of gray old elders with beards, that beards down to here, the most knowledgeable experts in the field, and they sit around the table and go, well, I think I think for that TSH test, yes, the literature is very clear that if it's within, if it's within this range, there's no problem. And that's, there's no such panel, you know, mm-hmm. of, of experts with it. And usually if there is, They are bought and paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. This is what the research shows. We actually look at the data. Most panels that put together the medical recommendations that are standard of practice correlate who's on the committee, correlates exactly with which companies gave the most money to that, whether it's the Endocrine Society, cardiac, whatever it is, and their people are on the committees, and they happen to recommend the most expensive drugs that company makes. It's not the science. It's all well-meaning, but this is where it is. So where does the normal range actually come from? 
Um, you know, one day I'd say, what the heck? Where? Who makes these things up? Um, and I looked into it, and I, it was a shock to me to realize that it's, a, you know, I looked at the Bureau of Lab Standards for the National Bureau, and what, where the lab ranges come from is they take 100 people, and they apply what's called two standard deviations. Put it to English, the 95 in the middle are defined as a normal range. And the, the high high and low 2% 2, 2 are defined as abnormal. That's it. So uh, even though the units will vary a bit, uh, the shoe size in the United States, any shoe size from size 5.5 to 11 is uh, 5.5 to 13 is normal. So I wear a size 12 shoe. If I walk into the office wearing a size 7, that's normal, even though I have a size 12 foot. Um, that's in the normal range. There's no problem. An income of $8,000 a year in the U.S. is what it takes to fall outside of the normal range. $8,100 a year is normal. Poverty is 16000 a year. So wow. the normal range is based on that you're not in the highest or lowest 2% of the population, period. Mm -hmm. Two standard deviations has very little to do with health. And I, I'll lecture to four or 500 doctors at a time. And I love asking that question, where does the normal range come from? from. And it's like looking at 400, you know, deers, you know, have you ever seen a deer in the headlights? You know, I ask that question, like, mm -hmm. I have no idea. The doctor doesn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then the TSH test, which they should be using the free T4 and the TSH, and ignoring those if you continue to have symptoms and treat you directly. But the TSH test, depends on the hypothalamic pituitary control centers, almond size control centers right back in the brain there, working properly. If they are not working properly, the TSH test is meaningless. When I lecture at the International Conference of Fibromyalgia uh, the year that, we were lecturing, that, that they had in Italy, I was lecturing with Professor Gunther Nick, who's the world's leading expert on thyroid issues in people with fibromyalgia hypothalamic dysfunction. And I asked him point blank, Professor Neek and Gunther, is the TSH test reliable in people with fibromyalgia? He said, absolutely not. His mm -hmm. research has showed us it's meaningless. But yet, that's what many doctors are using to steer. And you're going to find, especially now post-COVID, where we have another 10% of people came down with tripping that hypo, that control center, the hypothalamic circuit breaker. We call it long COVID here in the U.S. Um, or past, or any different names. But if you have the combination of can't sleep despite being exhausted and widespread pain, and it doesn't all go away with your thyroid dose, you likely have a secondary fibromyalgia or ME or CFS. There's alphabet soup, it's all the same thing. And even though I, I understand those of you with ME say, no, it's not, I'm not that crazy person with CFS. If you take 100 people with this condition, that's 100 different processes. And it's a very real disease for all of them. Hmm. And I apologize for medical idiots who say, I don't know what's wrong with you, so you're crazy. That is abusive, but it's not acceptable. Whatever name you care to use is fine, but that combination, when you trip that circuit breaker, the hypothalamus, you've got this process. You know it's there because you can't sleep well, even though you're exhausted. Hmm. But this is a sleep center as well as a hormone control center. And so you're saying, so that's hypothyroid as well as those things? You, but you, you both are going or are on. Are they overlapping? You, Yep. They're overlapping. You know, there is that you'll find that many hormonal disorders trip the circuit breaker, many inflammatory conditions. Auto, one third of people with autoimmune conditions, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune condition, but lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, other immune conditions, routinely one third of those will trip that circuit breaker and have an associated fibromyalgia or MB going with it. So what to maybe just explain what ME is for can you just, yeah, in, in the UK for? Australia it tends to in the US we use chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. Uh, in the UK, okay, Europe, you Australia, myalgic encephalomyelitis. People uh -huh. realized early on 
that calling people with this disease chronic fatigue syndrome was like taking diabetics and calling them chronic fatty fat person syndrome or some some idiotic name that belittles the person. Mm-hmm. And chronic fatigue syndrome it comes nowhere near describing the horrificness of this disease. And it's used to belittle people for doctors to say, I don't have the time to mess with you. I don't know what's wrong with you. The insurance company certainly won't pay me for taking the time to figure it out. So you must be crazy. So to avoid that stigma of chronic fatigue syndrome, the name myalgic uh, encephalomyelitis, which is not accurate. It's not an inflammatory brain disease. Uh, that's called uh, encephalomyelitis. It's you know, other inflammations in the brain. Um, but <laughs> so you have different names, none of which are really very good. And better to just understand what the condition is. You trip the circuit breaker called the hypothalamus. That controls sleep, hormones, blood pressure, pulse. Okay. And is that, does that then cause pain? Like, is that, what's the, can you explain that connection then with the pain <laughs> element? Okay. So you've t- we've taken a look and any, any kind of severe stress, uh, anything causes an energy crisis, uh, whether it's long COVID, whether it's low thyroid, whether it's that can cause you to trip a circuit breaker. Uh, because this area uses the most energy for its size of any area in the body. So energy levels go down, that circuit breaker trips, and now you've got a full-blown energy crisis. So there's seven key types of pain, but let's take a look at the main two that we see in this process. Number one is inflammatory pain, which is most of you don't have that. If you have pain, mostly just around your joints, around the joints of the finger, and they're red and swollen. That's probably inflammatory pain. But what most of you with fibromyalgia have is you have pain along the muscles. You have the pain in the back, sometimes along the chest wall, along the thighs. There's no red swollen joints. That, the vast majority of the pain is muscle uh, muscle pain. And you can tell because if you push over a bony area and you can reproduce the pain, you know, where you have the pain, you push yeah, and I feel a tight right knot. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, a, it's muscle pain. That's a bunched yep. up muscle. What yep. causes muscle pain? Okay, here's a key take home yeah, point. Okay, tell, this is the million dollar question. <laughs> and here's the million yeah. dollar question. Low and m- muscles are like a spring. It takes more energy to stretch the muscle than for it to contract. That's why mm-hmm. when, and that's counterintuitive, you think it would take more energy to stretch that muscle. Mm. But if you have a heavy workout, you don't come home and say, honey, my muscles are all loose and limp. You say they're all tight. Mm-hmm. It takes more energy to relax the muscle than to contract it. It's like a spring. It snaps shut and gets locked in the shortened position when you don't have enough energy. And after a couple hours, weeks, or years in that position, it hurts like hell. So, yeah, and I think I was reading in um, that was something that stood out to me when in your book about this was well, if it takes more energy for the muscle to relax, and if you've got low thyroid, <laughs> then you don't have the energy. The muscle just doesn't have the energy <laughs> to relax. Is that the is that the real key? That's what causes thyroid pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pain, not thyroid pain over here, but pain in your body, the vast majority in thyroid is the muscles don't have energy and they get locked in a shortened position. It may happen all over your body, which is fibromyalgia, or it may just be that if you carry a purse on your shoulder or you have bad ergonomics by your workstation or anything that stresses a specific muscle, that muscle is prone to getting locked in a shortened position and hurting. And most of you have the experience who then go, and, you know, you go to a chiropractor or you go to a massage therapist, you know, while you still had the money to afford that before you got destitute from this disease. And they went and they put energy in the muscle by pushing on it. That's a form of energy that they're putting in the muscle. Or you take an uh, infrared lamp and you put it on and that's a form of energy. Or you put a heating pad. That's a form of energy. Or you go into a hot bath with Epsom salts, that's a form of energy. Or you put an acupuncture needle in and turn it, creating a current, which is a form of energy. Anything that puts energy into the muscle helps the muscle to release. Mm -hmm. And then the pain goes away for a little while until the low energy makes the spring get locked in a shortened position again. Mm 
Mm. That's it's such a helpful explanation, I think, because I mean, it's taken me years to. Yeah, I mean, I think I have heard that before, but I'd forgotten. And so when I was reading that the other day, I thought, yeah, that makes so much. Just makes so much sense, really. But then, there's no um, money in it. It's ignored by doctors because there's no money in it, and it's very mm, time intensive. It takes mm. a lot of training to learn how to do a muscle exam. Chiropractors know, so the doctors said, "Well, they must be crazy because they can't know." <laughs> yeah, we can't have another modality. <laughs> be be <laughs> up up us. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not, not, if, not if it's not controlled by the MDs. Mm. So, is this solution just increase you? Energy. Function or what's the what, increase what energy? Increase, increase energy. energy. So yeah. there's all kinds of ways to put energy in the bottle on the body, and I, I call it the shine protocol. It's an easy way to organize it. So S is sleep. Make the time for sleep. Do what you need to get your solid sleep. So there's you have the melatonin. You've got all kind of herbal mixes and uh, essential oils. There are all kinds of things that can help you sleep. Now for those of you out. They're saying, there is no way I can get more than four hours or six hours sleep a night. I can't fall asleep. I can't stay asleep. And I wake up as if I'd never slept. You have fibromyalgia then. You have ME. Mm. You've got this process. Do the entire shine protocols I talk about in the book. If you think that I'm just in it for the money, I will send the 80 cents I make per book to charity. You let me know this. Charity. I was talking to my husband this morning because I wrote a book last year. It's it's in my little back corner too. And I'm like, yeah, you definitely don't make money selling books. <laughs> There's no money in books. If you've ever tried to make, if you think you're making money out of a book, you've never written a book. <laughs> yeah, I can, yeah. Be, I can be out shoveling snow in Hawaii here and make more money. So it's like, it's <laughs> the, the book will teach you how you can email me. My email address is fatigue, F-A-T-I-G-U-E, doc, D-O-C, like doctor, at gmail.com. You can ask me for the free uh, fatigue or fibromyalgia information sheets. Uh, those with, with fibromyalgia, you might find you get racing pulse. When you stand up after you've been up for 30, 40 minutes, you may go brain foggy. It's because the, this controls blood pressure. People's and pulse, that circuit controls autonomic function. When you stand up for a while, the blood gravity sends it to your legs and it stays there. And then you don't get the blood flow to your brain. You get foggy. It's just one of several reasons. But there's simple tests you can do at home. You check your pulse for 10 minutes. So you email me and ask me for the blood pressure information sheets. I'll send all of that to you for free. And then it's not hard. You can increase salt intake, or increase water intake. You can take care of these things. But first, you got to know what's there. Hmm. So, yeah. you send if, if you have that, if you can't sleep, even though you're exhausted, you've got the ME. I'll send you the information sheets, um, and that because I know otherwise it's just me earning my college nickname of Rambling Jack. So, um, <laughs> but this it's all kind of laid out. Then you don't even have to hmm. pay for the book. The book will give more information. It's all laid so, out in the book too, by the way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. It's very yeah. laid out. Like, and it's, you know, actually, uh, I mean, I'll do the plug for your book uh, because <laughs> what I liked about it was, you know, I like that you've got summaries, BFF summaries, brain, brain fog, fog friendly summaries. Friendly, mm -hmm. that's what I was, brain fog friendly summaries at the end, at the beginning of each chapter. You know, you say at the beginning, if you're dealing with this issue, go to chapter one and three, or, you know, like you're very, very specific. And there's cl clear protocols. So, um, I, I, some of the brands of supplements and things, I don't know if they will apply here in Australia, but it'll you know, you get, it'll be harder to get there, but you can, yeah, but you get, get the them. gist. Yeah. Yep. And even for them, like the ribos, you can find it there. It's going to be a different company or whatever, but you can find it. Um, yeah. There's a supplement. There's two studies out of, out of the four studies we've done in the last two years, uh, looking at post viral chronic fatigue and also fibromyalgia. There's a supplement you can get there that you can't get in the United States. It's available everywhere yeah. in the world, and it's mm. called Recovery Factors. Write this one down for those of you who feel really cruddy overall. Recovery, F-A-C-T-O-R-S dot com is the website. Okay. So recoveryfactors.com. Um, follow the directions on the website for how to take it. And the results are quite remarkable. I mean, we had uh, over 100 people in the one study and all of those had at least a 50% loss of energy. They were crippled with the fatigue. 
and the energy, it helped 60% of cases, and energy went up about 60% on average. Stamina went up about 80%. It was quite remarkable. One bottle was enough to tell. So that's you can't get that in the U.S., but you can get it in Australia. So that okay. gives you I'll put, I'll put the link ahead. to that. Yeah. For everybody who says, why can they get all that stuff in the U.S.? We can't get any of it here. Okay. <laughs> that. Um, but shine, sleep, hormones. Again, optimize thyroid. The way you do that is you realize, number one, the TSH is going to be low if you're getting a proper amount of thyroid and, and fibromyalgia. It's supposed to be like 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Do not use that as a main guide. I adjust thyroid dose based on, are you still tired, achy, weight gain, cold intolerant? Do you have symptoms of low thyroid? And I will continue to adjust the dose upward to where uh, as long as you're not feeling over overstimulated, I'm not going to do it. As, as, and as long as the free T4 is not uh, in the upper part of the normal range. So I don't know what numbers I'll use for the units in Australia. Here it's 0.7 to 1.5 roughly for free T4. And as long as it's 1.3 or less, most of you are fine. You're in the bottom 5% of normal range. You're not lucky enough to be in the lowest two percent, but you're abnormal. You're in the lowest four percent. See that all the time, and I could go through explaining why it is. But lowest four percent, yeah. So your shoe size is six, and your income's eighty-one hundred dollars a year. That's normal, no problem. Oh, you're crippled? Not my problem. You know, that's mm -hmm. I, I apologize for the medical profession for doing that. They're idiots. It's not acceptable. The thyroid dose should be adjusted to what feels the best, keeping the free T4 from going too high. It can go low if you're using desiccated thyroid, like armor mm -hmm. thyroid, the mix of then the TSH is meaningless, the T4 is meaningless as long as it's not going high. It may go low at, at the optimal dose. To put it in a very simple language, the thyroid form and dose is adjusted to what feels best to the person making sure that the free T4 is not going elevated for safety. Okay. Bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's, like, you sort of like that armor thyroid, the desiccated thyroid, that's your sort of starting point medication that, that you like to work with. It's a starting with. point. But then yeah. some people only, they don't tolerate any T3, so they can't use that. They need just the T4. Other people, the body makes the equivalent of about, 25 to closer to 35 micrograms of T3 daily is how much the body makes. There's a large chunk of people with receptor resistance. They need 120 micrograms of T3 a day to have normal thyroid function. And you won't tell from the tests. Um, but you need a holistic doctor that's trained in doing that. And you adjust it to what feels best. Um, everybody's different. The book goes through each of the different kinds of protocols for different types of thyroid and the rest. But the bottom line is that the form and dose of the thyroid should be adjusted to what leaves you feeling the best without symptoms of an overactive thyroid. Mm -hmm. The blood tests are secondary. Yep. Yep. It's complicated, isn't it? You know, like it does take mm -hmm. a while to find what works and it can vary over time as well. So yeah, it, yeah, it's so important to find a doctor that knows what they're doing. <laughs> yes. And you may have to try on a number of pairs of shoes till you find what fits, mm -hmm. but yeah. that's the best way. You see what feels the best to you. Mm -hmm. That will tell you better than any test. So you'll need to find a complementary doctor who is willing to treat you, a holistic doctor, and not only treat the blood test. And Annabelle, you're far better at guiding people at where to start looking for that in Australia than yeah. I am. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. We've talked about that before on the show too. So, and it, look, I think it's just as hard here as it is there. Like, I just think that's what I've noticed from this podcast and talk connecting with thyroid patients all around the world. The problem is the same whether you're in the UK, you know. Europe, can, you know, Canada, US, Australia, where it's the same problem. So you only need it's not to find easy, one. But... You only need to find one. Yep. Australia is a big, beautiful place. I've had the pleasure of visiting. But if you find somebody within 100, 200 miles of you, it doesn't matter if 99.9% .9 of the doctors have no clue. You find one who knows yep. to treat you and not just a blood test. That's all you're going to need. Yep. 
Yeah, the complex, absolutely. The I mean, I, I drive a hundred, no, oh, not quite a hundred kilometers, but I drive about an hour to see my, to find mine. Yeah. Yep. And, and I some, stopped for a little while to find a closer one and it was disastrous. <laughs> so yeah. and, it was like, and, it's and worth some, the drive. It's not that far. Yeah. And once and, you've yeah, had the initial true. visit, as long as you go in once a year, you know, or even not that, uh, many mm-hmm. of them will, will be happy to teach you by phone. Yeah. Ask. Yeah. So Good. shine. So we've done sleep, hormones. hormones. So also often accompanying the low thyroid is low adrenal. Uh-huh. Uh, that's yep. that's just hormone like cortisol. The blood tests, again, will miss the vast majority of people who need it. How do you tell? If you get irritable when hangry, if you get these, if when you get hungry, everybody goes hide in the closet because they're like a monster. That's, you know, um, simple way when you get irritable, ask your significant others and your family and your home, just feed me. In fact, do a little card that says, when I get hungry, feed me. Don't comfort me. Don't try to hug me. I'll claw your eyes out. Just feed me. <laughs> and if you find that after about five, 10 minutes, that irritability settles right down, that's low adrenal. If you're in mm-hmm. marriage counseling, good probability or divorce court, that's a good chance that you have low adrenals. Because mm-hmm. what happens is your blood sugar drops and it's like, you know, and the, you know, the moods are all over the place. And again, I had it myself. I had this illness. So I understand. And my wife yeah. knows if I get irritable, first she takes the personally and I say, oh, you're just hungry. Okay, good. Eat. Then we'll talk. <laughs> That's an okay. easier self. Easier problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, should so, have thought, I so used to be working family law, and I should have suggested that. Do you really need to be here? Do you just need to go deal with your adrenal health? <laughs> just, just eat. Just eat mm. when you're hungry. Mm. And you're going to want sugar. That will make the problem better for about a half hour and then put you on an emotional roller coaster. Protein. If you want one teaspoon of sugar, or if you want like a couple grams, four grams of sugar, you can put it under your tongue. It'll break the attack quickly without being enough to shoot you too high and too low and put you on an emotional roller coaster. But protein high protein diet mm-hmm. and when you have low adrenal you need more salt in most cases unless you have heart failure high blood pressure not much effect salt is minimal effect on that that's a medical myth mm-hmm. um and just regular just salt like, like salt I, mean, I, I like sea salt but i whatever salt mm-hmm. you have available yeah you know so like a know, little i was talking to someone about adrenals a couple of months ago and she was suggested putting a little like a little pinch of salt in your water is that Oh, well, gross, that... yeah. No. Uh, yeah, if you want it to drink salt so water. Great, but I wasn't yeah, sure. No, what I would do is just get some some, some salt crystals, like any, yeah. any from a salt grinder, and just carry them with you and pop a couple under your tongue. Uh-huh. Yeah. But the main thing is just you're going to find you crave salt. Use a salt shaker. Mm-hmm. Salt. Yeah. Even if people are saying, are you putting snow caps on top of your food? Well, yes, I am. Thank you. Yeah, because that's mm-hmm. what your body's needing. Okay. It'll tell you. And no, please yeah. don't drink salt water. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've got some electrolytes at the moment, actually, that have got a little bit of salt in it. That's got like a slight salty taste. They're quite tasty, actually, but that's not the same as the salt in the water. I was like, oh, I don't if really like the If it's tasting taste good, that. it's fine. Yeah. But if you have to yeah. gag to get it down, don't do that. <laughs> you know, don't <laughs> so, so the thing too, there's also, you can probably find a number of them, um, the, of supplements. They need the adrenal glandulars, licorice, vitamin C, and vitamin B5. Those are the big four things that you'll find in a good adrenal supplement that'll usually smooth things right out. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, but so in, look for one of those there. Uh, I, I don't know what the regulations are for what they allow and what they don't, but most countries will have that. So salt, you can just use your own. Be, realize that sea salt won't have the iodine. Be sure you're taking multivitamin that has at least 150 micrograms of iodine a day, uh, even higher than even up to the 6,250 micrograms, 6.25 milligrams. Um, you don't want so you're not, to. You're not worried about the too much iodine triggering the. Uh, as long as, as they're going uh, to six and a quarter milligram or less, I'm okay. I don't like the 12.5 because you may suppress. But don't start with 6,250 micrograms. You may flare your Hashimoto's in the beginning. Mm-hmm. You start with 150 micrograms that's in a good multivitamin. You give your body two months. Then it's the shift happens slowly. Then you can start raising it. Because some people, if you go from being iodine deficient 
to 100 times the RDA, some of you with Hashimoto's are going to flare your symptoms. You don't want to do, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why iodine's such a controversial issue in the thyroid space. Maybe Ease we... into it. Ease into yeah, right. it. Listen okay. to your body. Use mm-hmm. common sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think there's that fear of like, oh, maybe I just won't have it at all because I don't want it to trigger. But you're saying, well, your do you recommend testing you. to see if you are actually? No. Or do you think that's not right? <laughs> no. Okay. I mean, you no. know. If you look at the book Iodine, I know the guy who wrote it, he's a friend of mine, and he talks about doing the skin testing with that. And I said, have you ever seen a negative test? And he said, no, it's everybody's positive. I say, then why do you do it? And he says, I don't. Just treat them. <laughs> Take it, see how it feels to you. Mm-hmm. Start with 150 micrograms of iodine or even a little less. Ease into it. When you're finding, well, that feels fine, then you can go up. And then do the six and a quarter milligram, 6,000 micrograms, um, and do that for three months. Once you've worked your way up, and that will fill the tank, flush out things that block iodine, the other hell eyes, blah, 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 and do that for three to six months. And then the multivitamin with 150 micrograms a day, and you're good. Hmm. Because that really isn't rocket science, you Hmm. know. Yeah, but you've still got to know, and I suppose it's the monitoring it. And if you're doing, my tendency is to do too much at once, and then I don't know what's working or what's made the difference. And so I think each individual thing isn't necessarily rocket science, but when you try to kind of, when you're trying to manage it all. Uh, That's why the book organizes it it for people. (laughs) Yeah, 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 that's right. Exactly. Because I think we do need guidance. Yeah. You can't just, yeah, you can't just sort of. As you go through the brain fog yeah. friendly summaries, we could go through the whole book in probably an hour and get, mm. by going through the summaries and getting keynotes, you're going to find the certain things that, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, certain things your psyche hones in on. That, that, that's me. Mm-hmm. Good. Then do the deeper dive into the rest of that chapter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Start with those things, but shine. Sleep, hormones, we talked about thyroid, adrenal, uh, reproductive. If your symptoms started in your mid 40s and your symptoms are worse around your menses, not PMS, but insomnia, headache, uh, brain fog, fatigue are worse around your menses. You need estrogen and progesterone to buy, and not the poison synthetic. You need the bioidentical. The synthetics are made because they're patentable and profitable, and they're poisonous. Um, the bioidenticals, they couldn't patent, so they were cheap. Mm-hmm. And that's why the medical profession slammed them. But you can try it, find a good holistic doctor. You know, one way to find a holistic doctor is we have compounding pharmacies there. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Good. Ask the compounders who's good. Yeah. Don't expect them to badmouth anybody. They've got to work with those people in the community. But say, well, I've got this and this problem. If this was your daughter, who would you be recommending them to in this mm. area? Oh, well. Mm. And when the, you'll see, they can't, it's hard for them to give the names of some people and not the others because they have to live in that community, like I said. But when you're talking to the person and they say, oh, yeah, Dr. Smith, he's and then and they say, I'm Dr. Jones, you know, you can tell. And say, yeah. well, the health food source, they'll know who's good. Mm-hmm. But the compounders will know who can also prescribe. Yeah. And that's the big plus. So the health food stores are going to be looking for people who think that anybody, anything prescription is poison. So, you know, the, each has their benefits that they give you. Use all of them. You'll start and then talk to people, see who their eyes light up when they talk about their name. And that's how you know. Yeah, that's a good tip. Good tip. Yeah. So, do, yeah, do we want to, do you want to, are we up to I? Let's quickly go through I and E. Yeah. So, I yeah. would be infections. There are dozens of infections because the immune system goes down on this disease. The tests are unreliable for the infections. You have to go based on the symptoms. The book will say if you have nasal congestion, post-nasal drip that's not allergic seasonal, um, chronic sinusitis, irritable bowel syndrome, gas bloating, diarrhea, constipation, you need to be treated for candida overgrowth. There is no test I would give a nickel for. Or dozens of tests. They're all in my humble opinion, useless. Um, do you have chronic sinusitis? Do you have irritable bowel syndrome? Then you take the, the fluconazole for six weeks. If it gets better, okay, you know. And no, it's not this horrible poison, deadly thing. 
It's a lot safer than ibuprofen by far. Okay, so number two, um, viral infections. You have chronic flu-like symptoms. Uh, do you have long COVID? Did you have this after COVID? Um, the book will go through and the information sheet will go through that, but there's a mix of two medications um, that are antivirals. There's and just doing the other things can help. And is nutrition. You need a good multivitamin. You should have at least 25 milligrams of each of the B vitamins, at least 150 of B12. Uh, there's clinical essentials, but that, again, that's the United States one um, that I like to use. But you can find a good multi, but you want high levels of B vitamins, not the RDAs, not the ridiculous dietary allowances. Um, you want high levels of the Bs, at least 150 milligrams of magnesium, at least 15 milligrams of zinc, and just a good solid multi. And, and uh, Annabelle, you probably have brands and stuff that you can that are available in, in Australia. Yeah, there's lots of good ones. To. I mean, there's a lot of. I always say often the naturopaths here. Are, you know, I mean, they'll they often re recommend good brands because they're the practitioner. You know, quality ones. I hmm. I know I saw you mention a few of the DoTerra essential oils. I take the DoTerra Lifelong Vitality um, hmm. multivitamins. Um, that is feels like a good buffer, like good sort of base level for me. And I take a few, you know, extra specific mm -hmm. extras. But yeah. so I think there's there there's different ones around us. I often say yeah. go to a naturopath if you if you you know. I am on some vitamins. At least 150 of magnesium. At least 15 of zinc. If they're doing that, then the rest is probably going to be good. Okay. And then uh, the ribose, uh, coenzyme Q10, 200 milligrams a day with food. Uh, the ribose, 10 grams to 15 grams of the powder. Don't get capsules. It's stupid. You're taking 50 pills a day. Why do that? That looks and tastes like sugar. You could get a five-gram scoop and put it in your coffee twice a day or tea or cereal or whatever you're having. Um, and then the recovery factors. Like I said, the, it's brilliant. I wish we could get it here in the United States. Um, it's just we've seen so many people go from crippled to, oh, my God, I got my life back. You know, um, but they can't. The United States, God bless America, and may they kick out all the idiots who are beholden to all of the different companies and so that they can serve the public instead. We don't have a representative government anymore in this. Well, no, I, I'm wrong. It represents industry, not the public. Um Sorry. But no, it's all right. Anyway. We, that's, a, that's a whole big not the conversation, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and God bless them. They're all nice people. Uh, just that you know, and that's a different topic. Um, what you're hearing from the experts, understand that most experts these days are being paid off by industry. Um, they're nice people. They're good people. And most of what they're hearing on the news and otherwise is propaganda. I'm sorry. I don't, I, I don't want to come off sounding like a loony. But as a scientist, this is what we see. I'm quoted in the industry, in the media day in and day out. For some reason, they like me, even though I keep telling everybody that it's just making this stuff up. Well, if you're doing well, then. Me, <laughs> you haven't been cancelled. Is that what you're saying? I don't, you're doing something they, right. They kill me. Like <laughs> you know, they, you know, you'll see me day in and day out. About you know, about twenty percent of the time, I'm quoted accurately. A lot of times, I'm, I'm going out, through, out of the supermarket checkout. It's not going to come out. I'll pull one of the mag national magazines and I'll leaf through it to see what they're talking about. And I read these things. I say, I read these things. And God, what asshole said that? And it says, says Dr. Jacob Teitelbach. <laughs> you know, it's just sometimes <laughs> I just make stuff up. Right. And so keep your wits about you. The stuff that mm -hmm. I'm telling you, if it feels good to you and your gut instinct is, that makes sense. I want to do that. Then do it. If your gut instinct is no, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, and again, these are all good people. It's just the dynamics out there. And so, you know, the basics we talked about today, uh, and E is for exercise as able. But if you find that you, you know, you walk out to the postal box and you're sitting there in your bedroom for three days after, you have fibromyalgia, you know, the ME, as post exertional malaise. So you don't push through that. It's not going to harm you, but you're going to feel like death warmed over. You're going to feel bedridden for days. That's not good. Don't do that. But see how much you can do to maintain conditioning. But after about eight to ten weeks on this protocol, energy level skyrockets. Now you can start conditioning. Mm -hmm. So it's just a common sense kind of thing. And do things that you enjoy. A simple walks, a really good way. But some of you, you can't walk. Some of you are bedridden. 
Um, and those of you who are bedridden, it's not your thyroid. Unless you have the severe T3 receptor resistance, you likely have the secondary fibromyalgia. You have that blood pressure issue that we call the hypothalamic autonomic dysfunction, blah, blah, blah. When you ask for the blood pressure information sheet, I'll send you that. You'll do the testing at home and it'll tell you it's but three tests you do at home. Um, and then it'll say, here's what you do. As simple as increasing salt. I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but this myth of people where you said avoid salt, that's a horrible misinformation. Avoid sugar. Mm -hmm. Not salt. That doesn't mean your salt should be like, you know, a cup of soup is this is eighty percent salt or something, but you know, common sense. But use your salt shaker as much as your body wants. Your body in in these illnesses often needs more salt than water. I was saying, I drink like a fish, yes, but you pee like a racehorse. The hormone that holds on to water is also low. You're like a bucket mm -hmm. with holes in it. Drink more water. Yep, okay. So, pain. pain. <laughs> so, in terms of the pain, I think that's a real, I mean, I, I liked that shine. That It's always good when we've got something simple that we can hold on to. So, you know, that. Um, but if we just come back for a minute before we wrap up to pain, and I mean, other than, so increasing energy, you know, and obviously the shine protocol is all around um, that longer term increasing energy. We want to make sure we're getting adequate thyroid hormones. Uh, I mean, some of those things that you mentioned, like acupuncture, chiropractic, massage, heat therapy, are they all good? They help short term because they short -term, don't, you, yeah. they will stretch anything that stretches the muscle will ease the pain until the mm -hmm. muscle contracts back down again. Yeah. So, so it's a bit of short-term and long-term together. Like the sh that shine protocol do, is the longer-term solution, but in the short-term... Yeah, if you can afford it, go to your mm -hmm. massage therapist, go for the chiropractor, go for the rest. If not, mm -hmm. do the shine protocol, build your energy levels up, and mm -hmm. then go and have your muscles released by the massage therapist, the chiropractor, the, because then it'll persist longer and longer. Otherwise, you're mm -hmm. going to get feel better for three days to a week. It becomes unaffordable for many, for most people. Yeah. But once you've addressed the biochemistry, once you've built energy level with shine, now these other treatments that stretch the muscles will hold. Even just sitting in a hot bath with two cups of Epsom salt, mm. remarkably effective at releasing the muscles. And it's about 15 cents. Yeah, I know. It's a, it's a, and, and it helps you unwind generally. Um, what about pain medication? I mean, um, so if you are in they, any pain, should you do it? Should you not? The pain medication has its toxicities in the rest, but the pain is far more toxic than the medication. So let's go through this. Number one, it's like if you have your car and you have the flashing warning light on the dashboard, say the oil light is going off. And, you know, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, well, no problem. We'll just smash that light, cover it with a Band-Aid, cut it out. And then your motor burns out. And pain is kind of like the warning lights on a dashboard. If you put oil in the car, the oil light goes out. If you give your body what it needs with shine, the pain goes away. Um, if it's muscle pain, which most of it is. Then if it's inflammatory pain, um, curcumin, boswellia, um, even omega-3 fish oils. Uh, these are very, very good. The problem with curcumin is it's poorly absorbed. You can't really get enough in the diet unless you're eating an Indian diet to make the effect. Um, but Annabelle, if you know any highly absorbed curcumins uh, products in the country, those can be good. Um, so for the inflammation, curcumin, boswellia would be a good start. If you can order something called Curamin, C-U-R-A-M-I-N, um, they may even import that there. I don't know. It's made by a company called Terry Naturally. That's brilliant for inflammatory okay. pain, and that's very safe. In terms of medications, the ibuprofen, <laughs> 50,000 U.S. deaths a year, but it's still safer than the pain. So if it mm -hmm. helps use it, uh, acetaminophen is much more is much, much safer. So to start with the acetaminophen. The problem with acetaminophen is it will deplete antioxidants like glutathione. Uh -huh. So you may, if you're using, your, don't go over 4,000 milligrams or preferably over 2,000 milligrams a day total. You can lose your liver if you do that. But if you're doing the acetaminophen with, or paracetamol, I guess, with, you know, any chronic long-term use, get N-acetylcysteine at the health food store, NAC, oh, 500 yeah, yeah. milligrams a day, and that will protect your body so you can use it safely. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Most of the medications like gabapentin are very reasonable to use. Um, And the book talks about the whole list of medications. And again, you'll find that a low dose of several things for sleep or several things for pain works better than a high dose of one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because your body will handle the low dose and then you let it build up over time. In -hmm. terms of the question of should I take narcotics for pain? Well, preferably not if you can get rid of the source of the pain by putting oil in the car, so to speak, so the oil that goes out. But the pain is much more toxic than the narcotic. So if somebody is not getting good relief without the narcotic, then I think it's reasonable from beyond the narcotic, as long as they're not escalating doses. Mm-hmm. You can find a stable dose. And here's a funny thing. About 5% of you with fibromyalgia will find that if you take a narcotic, your brain and your energy comes back. You'll yeah. feel not high. You'll feel like I feel like a normal, healthy human being for four to eight hours hmm. after a dose. And that's because it's an endorphin deficiency in a percent of people. And that hmm. restores that as long as the dose is not escalating. So the bottom line, the... Pain is much more toxic than the medications. What do you mean um, by that? When you say pain is more toxic, what? what I think yeah, that chronic that pain, mean? let's see, what, what effect besides making people miserable, um, it will cause brain inflammation called microglial activation. It increases brain age an average of eight years, um, increases risk of senility, increases risk of suicide. Um, it's to- Pain is toxic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You so don't you don't have be to be suffering. Pain. I think that's the point. You don't, don't suffer. <laughs> no, because no, you're really going to be yeah. Yeah, don't, if don't you be think a hero. That you're being strong, putting up with mm. the pain, like you're going to go to heaven, and they're going to say, <laughs> well, "I I was 50 years in pain, and I didn't take a single pill." You're not going to get any pats on the back. That's like. Well, we sent all these things, so you wouldn't have to be in pain. Why didn't you mm-hmm. not take it? You know, mm-hmm. I'm teasing, but it's it's just it's okay to use what you need. The book will go through each kind of pain and how to make it go away. Uh, there's a list of really good medications, and these are fine, and even ones that your doctors will be more willing to, like the pregabalin, the Cymbalta or, or duloxetine. It's not a bad pain medicine, and I'm not saying they purposely made it impossible to wean off of. Although I think they did. Uh, this is this like the oxy? Is that what? The not oxycontin. What? No, no. Duloxetine is a non-narcotic. Oh, okay, um, All right. But they make it in a sustained release pill. That they have big things that say do not break or cut the pill. Oh, and I you, see. You okay. can't stop it suddenly. You can't go from twenty to zero. Could you go through withdrawal from hell? Just like you would from the Prozac, the antidepressants. You need to go from fifteen to 10, and then a couple months later to 5, but they don't make a pill low, less than 20, and you can't break them. Right. Okay. Okay. There's a trick for how to come off of it. The book talks about, you know, you, can, you can't break the pill, but you can cut it open. There's little beads inside, and you can wean down. Okay. Um, but there's countless natural and prescription things to get pain-free. And, and my uh, 50 years, like I mentioned, in medicine, I just retired from seeing patients last November. Um, I can count on my fingers how many of the thousands of people I've not been able to get good solid pain relief for. And mm-hmm. an important thing is called, if you're not on narcotics, there's a treatment called low-dose naltrexone. Mm-hmm. Very, very helpful, but you have to give it two months. And it has okay. to be less than five milligrams a day. It won't do anything until two months. But then the magic happens, and on the pain often goes away. For most, any chronic kind of pain, those of you who have CRPS, which hopefully none of you have, it's now treatable. Ask me for the CRPS information sheet if you have that. Um, you can ask me for the Lotus Naltrexone information sheet when you, if you email me, I'll send you that too. But if I know people do use the low dose that, naltrexone. I think sometimes to reduce thyroid antibodies and general inflammation. Is, would that be right? And autoimmune, autoimmune, yeah. or chronic pain in general. Yeah, yeah. Now, Seems to be a common. Specific, mm. It's wonderful. If it yeah. was patentable. It would be $25,000 a year. Every doctor would be prescribing it to everybody, but it's dirt cheap. 
So no, yep. it doesn't happen. <laughs> Not the money in it. All right. Well, look, I think, gosh, there's so much information that we've just covered in, um, you know, it's still a, we could talk for ages. I've got lots of, I've, <laughs> you know, there's lots and lots of things we could talk about. I could pick your brain all day, but um Jacob, is there, so you said you're not seeing patients anymore, um, but if people wanted to connect with you, um, obviously we can get your book. Right? Well, how should people connect with you? Where, where, how would you, or do you well, want people book, to connect with you? What's the, how well, do you the, the thing is that, you know, I can't go through your individual case and emails or my Facebook of thing, not. Yeah. but I do do short questions if they're like, you know, a few sentences that are, uh, I will sometimes as I can get to them. I will note again, email me for the information sheets at fatigue.gmail.com and just for the fatigue of the thyroid or the pain information sheets. I don't have the specific thyroid. We'll talk about the fibromyalgia. If you think you have that low blood pressure racing pulse, well, I'll send both of those together anyway. Um, if you have infertility, which is not uncommon from the low thyroid, mm -hmm. ask for the yeah. infertility information sheets. If you have the CRPS, ask for that information sheet. Um, but it, these will give you a really good start. Um, in the email I'll send you back, I will also let you know my old office educator, once I retired, uh, has to, does her own consulting thing. And she can do that with Zoom or online. Okay, good. And yeah. she won't pres prescribe. She's not an MD, but she's better than most physician experts. Uh, she's incredibly knowledgeable. She worked for me for about 30 years as my right-hand educator. And she consults with people. Uh, bus bargain, you're going to find anywhere. Um, she's on vacation for about six weeks now. But then, you know, because she's also retired a little bit with me, so she's taking a little time to decompress, and then she'll be back. Uh, she's a very good uh, place to begin if you're looking for somebody who can go through your case and let you know for your specific case to tailor, here's what you need. Here are the natural things you can do. And here's the things to discuss with your physician if you have a holistic doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are some good places to begin. Yeah, um, good. It'll I give you enough information you've got, you've got your to get social going media on. as well. There's I'm, that you're sharing a little bits of information on social media as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll put all of those links in, you know, in the description, you know, once this podcast is released too, but I think it's very, very generous to give your, um, you know, your, your email and take the time to respond to people's emails. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. That so, I, so. you know, again, when I came down with this illness and left me homeless, that's funny. It's as if I, I thought my life was over. I was I had to drop out of med school and I was sleeping in parks. And it's as if the universe put a holistic homeless medical school sign on my park pants. I never heard of matcher pants. I realized I didn't know there's such a thing. You want to be a healer, you got your MD. Um, and herbalists came by, energy workers came by, all these different people came by and taught me bits and pieces of what I needed to learn to recover. And I was able to recover, go back to med school, get my honors in medicine. And my passion has, for the last 50 years or so, has been making effective treatment available for everybody in a system that just doesn't support that. Mm. It's by educating you, empowering you with the information you need to get your life back. And people go, oh, my God, what a sacrifice you made. That's, I've made no sacrifice. I'm doing the most fun thing in the world for me. So I'm going to finish on this. You use this information we're giving you that Annabelle and I are giving you today. You get your life back. You feel better. Use that health and energy to do things you love. Don't go back to what made you sick in the first place or your body will blow your fuse again. Don't let your brain tell you because it doesn't know. See how things feel to you. Find those things that feel the best to you, that make your heart sing, that make your soul sing, make whatever you want to call it, that make you smile when you think about it. Do that. Use your energy for that. Your body will support you in staying healthy. And it will have made everything I do worthwhile. So, yeah. you know. Wow. Well, thank you. I think that's a perfect way to, to wrap up. I love, um, yeah. I love that often say, so, yeah, get get well so you can just get on with being you, you know, and the gift that you are to the world. So I yes. think that's I think that's absolutely perfect. Well, thank you very much for, for your time and your expertise and your generosity. So I want to say on behalf of everyone that's listening, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Annabelle. And everybody, this what you have is treatable. And if your doctor says, I'm sorry, I can't help you, tell them thank you for being honest. Go find somebody else who can. Annabelle knows how to direct you over in Australia and how to look. Beautiful. Thank you.
Okay, this is the Kiss Thyroid Coaching segment where I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions to help you to reflect on what you've just heard and to see whether there's any action steps you need to take as a result of what you have learned. So um, I don't know about you, there was a lot of information in there. I can tell you that his book's about 400 pages, has really does have a lot of specific detail in it. So if this sort of sounds like something that you want to dig into a bit further, maybe grabbing a copy of his book from Fatigue to Fantastic is a good idea. So I don't know, do you need to do that? The other thing I would say is he has generously offered a number of different um, free information sheets. So I've made a note, I've made a note of them as I've gone back uh, on to listen to this episode. So there's on fatigue, fibromyalgia, blood pressure, infertility, CRPS and low dose naltrexone. And his email address is fatigue doc. Um, so F-A-T-I-G-U-E doc D-O-C at gmail.com. And so you can just send him an email and he'll get back to you. So do you need to request any of those information sheets? Do you need to grab a copy of his book? Or, you know, is it one of those particular shine aspects of shine that you need to focus on. So sleep, are you getting enough sleep uh, and good quality sleep? The hormones, are they, um, you know, are they optimized, you know, particularly, I guess, for those of you listening here, particularly your thyroid hormones and your adrenals. Uh, what was the I was infections? Are there any infections you need to deal with? Nutrition. Are you on a good multivitamin nutritional supplement? Now that actually reminds me because he said it, one of the things I remembered him saying was, Annabelle, do you know of any good turmeric um, supplements? And I do actually. doTERRA do a really great turmeric supplement called turmeric duo caps. It's actually a combination of both the curcumin, so that's the dried um, turmeric and also turmeric essential oil. It's, they call it a duo cap because it's got both the essential oil and the curcumin. Highly bioavailable. Uh, so, you know, you could give that a go. <laughs> so I, I, it was sort of on a flow. So I didn't want to interrupt him when he mentioned that, but uh, I do know of that is a good supplement. Um, and the E was exercise as able. So are there any of those different shine aspects that you need to have a focus in on? Uh, as a reminder, you know, I'm of the view that it's very difficult to do everything all at once uh, in a way that's sustainable. So um, which one of those do you want to tackle first would be my question for you today. Uh, have a great fortnight. I will see you uh, in another fortnight. I've got a couple of great uh, interviews lined up. I'm talking about gallbladder health. I'm talking about genetics. Um, they're the next two uh, that I have lined up. So stay tuned for those over the next couple, um, next sort of month or so. And I'll see you in the Let's Talk Thyroid Facebook group. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Thyroid. If you have enjoyed the content or perhaps you're thinking, oh, my mum needs to hear this or my sister or my bestie, I would love it if you would share this episode with them. That really just helps spread the positive and practical message of Let's Talk Thyroid and helps um, that broader thyroid community, our friends and family to live well with their thyroid health. So you can just yeah share the episode. If you subscribe uh, on whatever platform you're listening to, uh, to this podcast, it's free. Uh, it's really helpful because then you'll be notified every time a new podcast comes out and it just makes it much easier to find. There's usually a little subscribe button or a bell or um, a follow often is the terminology. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be helpful. Of course, if you want to leave a review, even better, just a sentence or two about how the podcast has helped you. You can definitely connect with me via letstalkthyroid.com. That's where you'll find access to my book, my coaching, uh, my freebies, and really everything that I offer in terms of thyroid support. 